Hey, what's up, family? It's Mahalia, your host for your very special Moments with Mahalia. That's right, whether you tune in on the Moments with Mahalia podcast or you subscribe to this channel, I'm your one and only host, Mahalia. Okay, family, we are continuing our May series of Help I'm Battling. And not too long ago, I just wrapped up a conversation with a psychotherapist, right? And her name is Kelsey. And Kelsey is phenomenal. She's vibrant. She has so much information to share about how to help someone and how we can do some self-assessments to check in to see where we are mentally. Mm -hmm. And Kelsey and I were having this conversation talking about anxiety, stress, eating disorders, and a few other different things. And we ran out of time. So I was like, okay, Kelsey, let's run back to the table. Let's talk to the family. Let's connect with them. And so Kelsey, I really want to tap in and ask you, because I know a lot of people are saying, well, I'm trying to be successful. Or we hear the term about, I want to be the GOAT, greatest of all time kind of thing. Or I'm trying to stack people, all these different things we hear. And not really realizing the complexities or the other things in our life that may sometimes suffer or have a strain because we are striving for this idea of success. Can mm -hmm. there be a, a track to success that actually decreases a level of unhealthy stress? And can we really begin to stop looking at stress as being this thing where I have to have it if I want to be great? Yeah, yeah. I love that question. And you said a lot of good things that I want to tap into. But, you know, you put success in quotations. And I totally align with that because I think the big thing to think about is like how one identifies success right and is the achievement of success is that is that in reflection of your bank account is that in reflection of the type of car that you drive and so i think we have to think about my personal um definition of what would look what a successful life would look like for me um and in that you know if somebody is saying like success looks like my bank account and stress then it's like, okay, then that's the choice that you're making. If stress is the thing that's like motivating you to get the things done. But to answer your question, I do believe that there is a route to success that can go along with decreased levels of unhealthy stressors. Um, pieces from some of the conversation that we had earlier is just that in life, there'll be inevitable stressors, right? Like stress is this normal thing. And yes, it can be really motivating sometimes to help us like get things done. And so when I think about that, I think about that you stress or that good stress. Um, and those good stressors look like things that typically translate to excitement, right? And so back to what we kind of mentioned uh, for the folks that got to listen in on the podcast, but for you folks that are joining us on the uh, Mahalia's YouTube channel, we just talked a little bit about um, stress being this this level of like activation. I like to look at it like activation that lives in the body or that may live in the mind cognitively, right? And so that good stress, that you stress is the excitement, right? And so that can again come up in, you know, we are asking someone out on a date for the first time or, you know, we're somebody just swiped on us and we're interested in them and we get a little excited and we're going out and we feel a little, you know, a little tingling or the butterfly sensation, whatever. Um, that's that good you stress. Another thing that I think is useful when we think about alertness, when we think about activation that anxiety brings or that stress brings, uh, oftentimes we think about this analogy of if you're walking down a dark alley or if you are, um, if something if something happens and your body alerts you, your body activates you to pay attention to your surroundings, that is a good positive thing. And so there is good stress. There's stress that keeps us alert. There's stress that keeps us motivated. But for the folks that are out there, like I want to be the GOAT, I got to do this, I got to do that. You know, my question to you is thinking about at what expense? You know, at what expense? Am I working myself into the ground and my quality of life is not reflecting in a way that I would like, or, you know, I'm not really achieving full success because yes, my bank account is loaded, but I don't have any relationships. I don't have anyone to share it with, you know? So at what expense is the thing that I want us to think about? And again, we get to decide our personal definition of what success is, not society's definition of success, but your personal definition of success. 
I know people that a successful life for them would be being able to spend good quality time with their family or a successful life for them would be getting to, you know, engage in mission work and do something for, you know, engage in a cause and do something for other people. You know, so you get to decide what success looks like for you. And again, back to that, like at what expense, I think we talked about this a little earlier, um, knowing that there'll be stressful situations that come up in life, we get to ask ourselves, like, do I have to struggle along the way? Do I need to increase my suffering to get things done? No, like, I don't have to increase my suffering to get this paper in. I don't have to increase my suffering to work myself or to work up, um, to climb the corporate ladder or, you know, to get this promotion. Um, so I do think that there are healthy ways to still be, to achieve success that we define. It's interesting because I finally found myself getting to a point, Kelts, where it's not about trying to be successful. Great. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear the term, be successful, be the best at whatever it is that you're doing mm -hmm. versus being great. And mm -hmm. for me, there's a difference between successful and great. Because when you're mm -hmm. striving for greatness, you're wanting to optimize your potential. You're wanting to make sure that you are nurturing every gift that you have. And if you're looking at me thinking, hell yeah, what? Great, successful, they go hand in hand. Okay, but think about <laughs> yourself. What stressors or what's the additional weights that connect to great for you versus successful? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. the results allow you to reach and maximize your full potential, then maybe the terminology has to shift so that your focus gets back to your purpose, understanding the clear reason behind your why. And with all of this, then Kelsey, of success, greatness, stress, all these different things, is it possible to go through the day or live a life where our stress, or excuse me, our actual response to stressful situations can transform because we have very minimal control over the heightened situations or the stress that may come up, but our response to it, our response to it, I think that's very critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. And like, so what you're mentioning, or at least what it's making me think about is those chronic stressors, right? Or um, those ongoing stressors that what we talked about earlier about that avoidance piece right we keep pushing it off we keep pushing it off it keeps piling up it keeps piling up it keeps piling up and it just goes unaddressed and so i think that that can have a number of just different different negative outcomes for ourselves you mentioned something earlier in our conversation just about the prevalence of heart attack for folks that avoid or that suffer from severe anxiety um one thing that you know my mom used to always say is like stress will kill you and it really will it really will and so those things that go unaddressed those things that go unhandled those things that we push to the side and that we avoid can absolutely turn into something detrimental um, and harmful if they go unaddressed and unapproached and just unacknowledged right like we have to be able to acknowledge those things for ourselves we have to be able to take a moment take a moment with Mahalia um, and take a moment and just say like how am I doing like am I okay and how do I know um, and I think that can be for the for the the, the, the workaholics or the the folks that are chasing this like success, um, sometimes it can be hard to recognize when we're not doing well because we've been so used to functioning um, in this state of heightened anxiety or heightened stress. But I think, you know, there are other, our body gives us other cues and signs that lets us know, hey, we're not okay. Folks that suffer from insomnia, folks that suffer from nightmares, folks that suffer from, um, you know, disordered eating patterns, folks that suffer from severe headaches, Folks that can say like they're, again, I go a lot to relationships, but their relationships are suffering. Like there is a lot of indicators that can let us know that maybe we're not functioning at our highest. Maybe we're not in, you know, that great space. Um, and so it takes a level of just mindful awareness and being able to assess our situations holistically. Um, 
excuse me, to recognize like, okay, maybe I do need to reassess and maybe I do need to pay closer attention to how I'm living um, and how I'm taking care of myself. I hope that answers your question. It did. Now, once we do these self-assessments and we check in with ourselves, are there techniques that we can practice in the middle of our day to kind of bring us back to our homeostasis, Mm -hmm. as well as the importance of knowing, hey, maybe you have to pick up the phone and call a resource. What are some of the techniques and resources available to us? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's useful. I love what you mentioned and we'll, I'll go off of this of just like taking that moment throughout your day, just, just to self-assess. A lot of times I think it's useful to ask the question of like, how's my heart today? Um, Like, how am I, how am I feeling today? And how do I know? Right? Like what, what's the, what, what's, what's the evidence? I feel happy. Well, what is the evidence? How do I know that I feel happy today? I feel stressed. Well, how do I know? And I think that's a part of that, that self-assessment, right? It's not just like, well, I feel sad. I don't know why I feel sad. How do I know that I feel sad? What are the indicators that I feel sad? Well, I cried this morning, but I can't understand like, you know, where those tears were coming from. So it takes a level of like deep diving um, and kind of digging and self-assessing to figure out like, what is the root? Where is this coming from? Um, What's the motivator behind this thing? What's influencing this emotion? Um, And so from there, resources are things that could be useful. I like to think about journaling as a form of just like purging, getting things out. I like to think about, and journaling can look a number of different ways, right? I think sometimes folks are like, I don't have time to like sit and like get my pen and pad and like write. You You can journal in your phone. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you can journal in your phone. I am like a fan of video journaling or audio journaling and just taking that time to like purge and release and let things out. And so, and for folks that are watching this, I am, my goal is to give uh, resources that won't be a financial burden or like resources that we have access to daily, right? Um, Because we have to take care of ourselves every day. Not just when you're with your therapist, not just with your, when you're doing your boxing class to like release some stress, not just when you're working out, but we have to take good care of ourselves every day as much as we can throughout our day. So my, my goal is to offer resources that we have on hand daily. Um, so journaling as a form of, again, purging and just releasing and letting things out. Deep breathing, like we mentioned earlier, and just being able to take a moment to really honor and access our breath, right? It's a great thing that we have every day that we have, you know, access to oxygen and breath. Yes. <laughs> you know, I think it's useful to just take advantage of that. And Mahalia, you mentioned something really important earlier about just scientifically, um, the fact that the brain needs oxygen to level, to level out some of the chemicals. And so taking that moment of stillness and mindfulness to just breathe can be really therapeutic and really helpful. And maybe it won't change your situation, but I think taking that mindful moment can help us proceed mindfully from there. All right, this thing is stressing me out. I got a flat tire. Let me just take a couple of deep breaths. And let me just like relax my shoulders because how often do we notice that so much tension just lives right here. We just walking around in the world doing this, you know, releasing my shoulders a little bit, relaxing my face and closing my eyes and just taking a deep breath for a moment and just being still and just being here and how that sets us up to proceed mindfully and make better decisions. All right, I got the flat tire. Okay, what can I do? I'm gonna breathe for a moment. All right, I'm gonna figure this thing out. You know, it's great that I have resources. I actually have AAA. Boom, I can do the things that I need to do. That was a stressor. We handled it quickly. That was one of the acute stressors. That's an example of acute stress that we talked about earlier. Those surprise stressors that might come up that need a quick response. But once we respond to them, that decreases our stress. We're able to de-escalate that situation. So journaling, deep breathing, that purging, physical activity and moving our bodies. Man, I'm a big believer that, again, I mentioned earlier that the body keeps the score, the body communicates with us, it lets us know what it needs. But not only that, but when it comes to anxiety and tension, we hold, we store a lot of that in our physical containers and in our bodies. And so I'm a big fan of using physical activity as a form of, again, purging and releasing. 
because that's what I want us to get into the habit of thinking about. I am feeling stressed, I'm feeling anxious. Okay, how do I release this, right? And so that physical activity, moving our body in those ways can be a really cool, healthy, fun, exciting way of releasing uh, physical stress that that is held in, in the body. Um, and so that can look like going for a walk, that can look like going for a run, that can look like doing some hit exercises outside or, you know, taking a yoga class or, you know, any form that you enjoy moving your body. Um, and then I'll also share, you know, reaching out for support, reaching out for support and asking someone, you know, to just listen if that's what you need. I think it's useful to go into those situations knowing, do I need a listener or do I need a responder? and advocating for that, letting that person know like, hey, I'm struggling, this is what I'm going through and I just need to vent, I just need to let it out. But all, all of those things are in line with releasing, purging, letting it out, right? Not keeping it stored up, but releasing. You know, I was even thinking, Kelsey, about music yes. and how there are some artists when you listen to their songs, you're like, wait a second, is this a poem? Mm -hmm. because the lyrics are more than just those surface layers of dance, 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 move, 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 but it tells a story. It evokes different levels of, of emotion that are run a little deeper. And there are some artists who say, you know, this was what was coming to me in a certain moment in my life, whether mm -hmm. it was a high moment, a middle moment or a low moment, right? Poems, poetry, same mm -hmm. thing. There are there's power within our words. We have the ability to really shift our mindset in a way that moves us from staying stuck, like how when there's a record or a scratch on a record and it says, <laughs> like move us really from that place uh -huh. to actually continuing to play the song. But we have to figure out, spend time with looking at, well, what do I like? For example, I like food, I like to cook. So cooking is a stress reliever. It mm -hmm. is a, me being in the kitchen, moving from spices to herbs and just moving around the kitchen levels me back out, puts me back at my homeostasis. Or for my folks who have pets, when you have a dog that really likes to walk, Mm -hmm. That is very beneficial for you to really spend some time with being at one with nature and thinking about what information do I need to dump out of my mind? Mm -hmm. I like to call these things when you were talking about your voice recordings or the journals, I have what's called noodles mm -hmm. and it, they are literally my note doodles mm -hmm. and it could be a few words that come to my mind because of whatever it is that I'm working on or mm -hmm. if I happen to walk and I start thinking about something, I'm like, oh my goodness, let me just talk to myself for a moment. Let me jot down and so that I can move past this because when we don't purge or we don't empty out our minds, I believe Brian Tracy talks about this too in some of his books. And there are some other professionals who, are, who talk about it from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. Brian Tracy, just for lack of better terms for, for everybody to know, he talks about how do you maximize your time? How do you basically create a schedule, create a structure that allows you to operate at your best. So he's not coming at this thing from a clinical standpoint. He talks about mm -hmm. it just really from a business professional, purging, mm -hmm. writing out whatever it is that you're planning to do because the longer we store up thoughts in our mind, see your mind almost as if it's a, a memory card, a storage mm -hmm. of some sort. The more you continue to store, there is a capacity there is a max capacity on any SD card, any memory card that you have. So it's essential and it's important for us to dump, archive mm -hmm. a few things, place certain things in their respective folder, file accordingly. Like my, mm -hmm. it's time for spring cleaning kind of mm -hmm. right now. We are in that moment while we are spring cleaning our house, let's spring clean our mind so that mm -hmm. we can really continue to move on so that we can continue to stay moving forward. Mm -hmm. So Kelsey, like, see, I'm excited about this thing, girl. See, I'm excited. Uh, one of the things though that I do wanna make sure that we tap into before we wrap things up for the night mm -hmm. is we've talked about stress. 
and we can have conversations about stress and say, you know what, girl, I'm stressed out a little bit and laugh it off. Or we can be in those moments where we're in our low lows where it's like, man, I don't know how to get out of this. Mm -hmm. I'm now moving into a depressive state because I can't shake this. The mm -hmm. pressures of life have moved from exciting me to getting me move forward to now becoming such a burden that I don't think I can even keep moving and I can't crawl all these things to that same stress could take us to a place of abusing food, mm -hmm. withholding nutrients from ourselves, mm -hmm. to getting to a place where it's saying, because this hurts, I'd rather hurt as well physically. Mm -hmm. yeah. How can we gain better understanding about the intricacies of eating disorders that could potentially also be ignited from stress, life situations. It's a compact thing. I know we've talked about that, of how it's very complex of how we reach these elements of understanding or finding somebody experiencing an eating disorder. But can you help us to kind of understand about what really this may entail? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like you mentioned, eating disorders are so complex and there is continued and ongoing and growing research on eating disorders and how they translate to different cultures um, and like you mentioned different things that may cause or influence eating disorder behaviors um, and I want to make sure that I mentioned disordered eating behaviors and eating disorder behaviors right and just the difference and just the difference in, in that um, and so like you mentioned, you know, anxiety is absolutely or can absolutely be one of the um, like precursors, if you will, to um, an emerging eating disorder. Um, and so that can look like, um, you know, I am so stressed about this thing. I'm so anxious about this thing. I can't, I can't eat you know, and that ends up being, again, that is more in the category of disordered eating behavior versus eating disorder behavior. And I'll get into, you know, the differences there. Um, or even like you mentioned earlier too, about, you know, I am so, I'm feeling so low. I'm feeling so blue. I don't have any meaningful relationships. I don't feel cared for or loved right now. I'm like struggling to love myself. Food is the only thing that brings me comfort right now and so I'm going to overindulge in in these things and so again a disordered eating pattern now where we get into severe and chronic eating disorders diagnosable um eating disorders is when we start to notice these things that are interfering with our, our daily living and when these are ongoing patterns that affect again how we care for ourselves and our overall just relationship with with food right and so I think it's important just to look at our relationship with food um, and even some of the relationships with foods and what we've observed growing up in the home right and so how often can we say and I think this can vary by culture um, and just like different different socioeconomic backgrounds too um, how often have we heard stories of folks that say things like well I couldn't get up from the table unless I finished everything on my plate you know and even past fullness Right. And so what that is influencing and, you know, for to the to the parents defense, that could be, you know, this we worked hard to make sure that we right. had that we were able to provide this meal for you. And so I need you to eat everything that's on your plate. So, again, speaking to the just the varying things that may happen um, by culture, by socioeconomic status, but all of those things can influence unhealthy relationships with food and unhealthy um yeah, unhealthy relationship with food and how we use food versus how food fuels our body um, and getting into a place where, again, we're either abusing it or underusing it. I think a lot of it, too, comes from this idea that we need to, when, when I think about restrictive eating or anorexia, um, restrictive eating behaviors, restrictive um, intake food disorders, um, I think about this like desire to change myself based off societal standards or what I'm seeing in the movies, what I'm seeing in the magazines. I desperately need to change myself to fit into this 
to, to fit into this mold. Um, and so I think that's where we kind of get into some of those restrictive eating patterns, the comparisons and what other people are looking like and, you know, the genes that the kids are fitting into and I need to be able to fit into these genes. Um, and then again, when it gets into like binge eating disorders, what I've noticed and just from some of the folks that I've worked with, a lot of times that has been used as a self-harm um, mechanism of I, you know, don't don't really like myself and so I am going to abuse this thing and I am going to eat past my capacity and I am going to um, engage in purging activities you know so I'm saying all that to say that eating disorders can be so so complex in the DSM there is there is a diagnosis that is eating disorder unspecified anorexia nervosa unspecified bulimia nervosa unspecified ARFID unspecified because it can just be so complex and can vary from person to person. And so I think, or I know that is another reason why our research continues and why things continue to develop is because we're trying to figure this thing out. Like, where is this coming from? There's also research that talks about this predisposition of, you know, I grew up with, my mom had an eating disorder, my dad had an eating disorder. And so here I am predisposed to this thing clinically. And so there's research out that's about that as well. So all that to say, Eating disorders are complex, that it's important to think about our relationships with food. Um, it's important for us to think about mindful eating. It's important for us to think about um, how our eating patterns influence those around us if we have children. It's important for us to think, our relation think about our relationships with our bodies how we speak to our bodies, how we speak about our bodies to ourselves, but also how we do that in front of, again, others that we may be influences, i.e. children or younger siblings or folks that are coming after us. And so again, it takes a heightened level of just mindful awareness of food intake and our relationships with our bodies. But I think it also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I'm listening, go ahead. Oh, I think I might've, I think I might've echoed. Um, but I think, uh, also, if we can, if we can shift to this space of honoring the body and emphasizing self-care across the board, not just like, okay, I'm gonna take this bubble bath, I'm gonna do this face mask, but self-care as it relates to, I'm gonna fuel my body with the nutrients that my body likes and that it needs. I'm gonna give it adequate nutrition because that is how it functions. I'm gonna rest my body because that is how it uses all of the nutrients that I've given it. I'm gonna move my body. So again, if we can focus on how can I just overemphasize self-care across the board and how that can translate nutritionally, how we're speaking to our bodies, I think we'll be in a in a better in a better position. I definitely agree. I definitely agree. If we care for ourselves holistically, our health can change in so many different avenues. There are studies out there that talks about for folks who've had chronic illnesses and they've changed their food intake. They increase eating more of the right nutrients versus processed foods and how their health changed. Mm -hmm. There are studies by Dr. Mark Hyman who talks about how what you eat affects the chemical balance in your brain, which then influences emotional imbalances and different disorders and could potentially lead to different mental disorders. And so since we're talking about this subject and it's Mental Health Awareness Month, let's take some time, family, really. Let's take some time to check in with ourselves on, hey, did I eat properly? Or did I eat a bunch of fast food today? Mm -hmm. Or did I sleep like Kelsey mentioned earlier? These questions may sound very surface layer or questionable to you, but to your body, your temple, mm -hmm. these are important questions to ask so that you make sure you take care of this thing. However long you're renting this body, Kelsey, like however long a person is renting this body, they wanna ask themselves, am I taking care of my Porsche like a Porsche should be taken care of? Or am I treating my Porsche like a Pinto? Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. still, if I had a Pinto, I want to take care of my Pinto like it was a Jaguar. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these are essential questions that we should ask ourselves. And I'm just thankful that you were able to help us understand a little bit more about the complexities within these different challenges that people actually experience daily. 
and really helping us understand too how we started off of understanding of I want to be the best version of myself I want to accomplish things I want to leave a legacy for my children I want to accomplish the things that my family may have never been able to accomplish those are great things to strive to fulfill but also remember at what cost Mm -hmm. priorities understanding your priorities your foundation things of that nature because when you really can understand your foundation what's important to you then you can then look at okay well wait a second am i putting too much of an emphasis on the things that don't really matter am i stressing out about this this and this when i probably need to actually spend time and realize wait a second i haven't really spent time with my children in like three months because i stayed in the office and i leave in their sleep i come home from work in their sleep there's an imbalance if i say i value family that's that's a problem uh so these different elements life living life is already complex within itself so i'm just grateful that you were able to share some of this information with us and before we sign off as a psychotherapist you have experienced so many different things and you have probably a plethora of knowledge and a a lot of different areas that i know we did not cover when you reflect on your why, why you do what you do, where is that coming from? What is your why? What is stimulating Kelsey to be passionate about raising awareness for those who don't have a voice in understanding about mental health or those who would like to know, but they may not have the resources and the knowledge to understand more about mental health and even being passionate about everybody striving to maintain their synergy. What is that feel for you? Yeah, I love that. I love that you asked that question. And, you know, Mahalia, I think that our whys get to uh, journey with us and mature as we mature. And I can truly say that through my lived experiences, um, that keeps me that keeps me inspired, that keeps me, and I'm, I'm leaning away from saying motivated, but it keeps me invested into the work because of um, my personal my personal life and the things that I've experienced, the battles that I've had, the trials that I've grown my way through, um, and just recognizing that, you know, we are all humans trying to figure this thing out. And so if even an ounce of what I experienced and supporting someone else can be helpful to them, there's no way that I can just keep that to myself. There's no way that I can just keep that to myself. If I know that I've had a similar experience to somebody and that these are the ways that I worked, that I worked through it, that I grew through it, that I healed myself, I cannot, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I just like kept those, kept those things, you know, in. Um, and I think that is another reason why my, my love and my passion and my work for the field of eating disorders, particularly for women of color has continued to grow because again, of my personal lived experience and some of my personal battles, battles with disordered eating, um, and competitive athleticism. And it's interesting because before I had my own experience with disordered eating and body image distress and all those things, I worked at an inpatient facility, you know, and my heart went out to those kids, but it was just kind of like where, where my life landed me, right? Like I graduated and I started at, um, I, I worked at a couple of different outpatient practices and then I just migrated and found myself at this at this hospital or in this hospital setting supporting adolescents and teens that were battling eating disorders um and again like i mentioned at that time i wasn't currently battling with anything but i think you know we all have our own body image something that comes up at some point in life you know whether it is my eyebrows touch or (laughs) whether it is my thighs don't touch you know we all have some sort of body image something that comes up And it wasn't until later after I had left the hospital that I too started to battle with some of those things that I was supporting and helping other people with. And while I was passionate then and wanted to support and help, I didn't understand at the same capacity that I do now because I had my own journey, my own lived experience. And so really lengthy way to say that I am human, that we're all human, 
that we all will have battles, that we'll have challenges, and that we'll have struggles. But I'm a firm believer that from each experience that we have, that there's information to take from it, that there's something that we can take from it, that there's purpose, that there's value that we can take from it. And I would be doing myself a disservice if I kept that to myself. Um, I am heavy into my faith. Um, and I believe that God brings me through situations for a reason. And so I feel like I would be fumbling and mishandling my gifts if I didn't use them in my experiences to support and care for other people. Wow, Kelsey, powerful story, uh, powerful. So I thank you for entrusting me and our MWM family with your story just even in those brief few moments, very powerful. Um, uh, while you were talking and me just processing, I see it as let your life be a testimony Absolutely. to help someone along the way. Mm-hmm. And your ability to acknowledge that, hey, I'm not there yet. But let me tell you how I was able to slay this giant Mm -hmm. somewhat, reshape that experience to be able to be a powerful tool to help someone else along their journey. And it's about community. And with the monthly focus from NAMI on You're Not Alone, that's just a sign right there of, and a reminder that we aren't alone in this fight. There are people within our communities who are in strategic positions, who are passionate about what they are doing, but can also be an example to let you know that you can get through, which really shines some hope, some light of hope into a dark tunnel. And if someone is thinking, hey, well, it was just me or, whoa, it's me, I'm in this by myself, no beloved you're not (laughs) now our stories may not look exactly the same Mm -hmm. but our struggles can be very similar Mm -hmm. probably more similar than what you think Mm -hmm. so i say that to say to whoever's watching to really be courageous enough to say i choose me today Mm -hmm. be courageous enough to reach out to a resource at the bottom of the screen You'll see information about free resources, crisis, confidential text lines. If you don't have the courage to pick up the phone or an email that you can send and say, Hey, I'm struggling in this area. Or you can go to a website. If you are a caretaker, or you happen to be a bystander of seeing someone struggling, figuring out, well, how can I be of a better support system to someone? Or how can I show up? for someone who may not be able to show up for themselves in this moment. Mm -hmm. We all can play a role with making this world a better place, making our communities a better place, encouraging the people that we love and that we know to be a better version of themselves, to be holistically healthy, mind, body, and spirit. So Kelsey, I thank you for taking time. I thank you for just being you educating us but also connecting with us on a deeper level is greatly appreciated is there anything else before we log off tonight that you want to share well i just want to say i appreciate you for the work that you're doing um i appreciate you doing the mental health spotlight that you're the series that you're in um and i appreciate you for thinking of me and reaching out to me and having this conversation it's been great um to those that are watching that are listening in think about just something good that you can just do for yourself you know something that you can do for you something special that you can do for you um and that can look like whatever it needs to that can look like taking a break that can look that can look like listening to your favorite song but just be intentional about all right something that i can do for myself right now in this moment thank you so much kelsey family you heard it from her i'm gonna end on that note Think about doing something for yourself and then actually execute it. Do that Uh thing for yourself. Love on you. Don't Uh just say, oh, this is what I want to do and you write it down. No, Uh actually love on you this week, this month. I challenge you all family and I'm gonna hold myself to it. I'm gonna join in on this challenge. 
let's love on ourselves at least one time this week. And if you're following Moments with Mahalia on Instagram and Facebook, I want you to drop your picture, tag Moments with Mahalia in it, hashtag Moments with Mahalia, and then also let's hashtag not alone. Mm -hmm. Let's spread this love. Let's be an example. Let's encourage our brothers and sisters along the way on this journey, excuse me, on this growth journey. Mm -hmm. All right, family. That's about it for this moment. I'm so excited. I'm glad to connect with you. Remember, if nothing else this week, if no one else tells you this, that they love you, I want to let you know that I love you. That's right. I love you. And you can't do anything about it, okay? So let that love merit. And remember to live life like a boss. So be brave, optimistic, selfless, and most importantly, strong. I'll talk with you all soon. 